Of course, many of you know Jason uh, Peck, our assistant pastor here. He uh, was invited to go to Iraq months before he, he actually went, and the week that he went is when uh, Mosul was liberated. And so they said, and uh, he, he's going to just share uh, some, of, some of the things that, that's uh, happening in Iraq and the things that I, I don't think the news media is going to tell us or, or any other news source. And uh, would, would you give Jason a welcome? Just, he's going to come up and share with you guys today. Good evening, church. How are you? Good, good, good. I'm so excited to be here tonight to share with you guys all the absolutely amazing things that God's doing in a worn, torn country. And I give him all the glory for orchestrating what he orchestrates, that we have no clue of what goes on in the mind of God all we know is what our responsibility is, is to respond to what he's put on our hearts. And it's exciting whenever I go through this and I think about it and, and, and I start going through the pictures and I start thinking about how this whole thing came to happen. And, and I just rejoice that we have a God that's actively alive in our lives every single day. And he manifests his way in so many, himself in so many different ways. He manifests himself predominantly through love. And it's the love of Jesus that brought this whole thing together. Tonight I'm going to share with you guys some devastation, some some, some joy, some happiness, things that will make you angry, things that will make you sad, things that will make you leap for joy. But before we do that, I don't want this just to be a storytelling night, because it always has to start with God's Word, right? God's Word is so holy it is so precious, and we can hold it into our hands, but sometimes we take it for granted what God's word is. But God's word is the one thing that he holds higher than his name. And if we do anything, if we have any admonition or any fear of the Lord, or we have any love inside ourselves, we are going to esteem his word because he holds it higher than his name. And that's how he speaks to us. He says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up his holy word and we're going to see what he has for us tonight. So Heavenly Father, we thank you. We ask you as we open up your word that you would speak to us, that you would illuminate your word to us, that you would give us a special revelation and insight into your mind. Lord, we can't comprehend the, your majesty, Lord, but through the Holy Spirit, Lord, you could speak to us as we're the temple of the Spirit. And Lord, you're the author and finisher of our faith. Speak to us now through your words and help us not only be hearers of the word, but doers, that we would apply your word to our lives. Bless this time. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, it states, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men before the will of God." Here we tell us that, that since Christ suffered in the flesh, that we ought to arm ourselves with that same mind. The word arm in the Greek is haplizo. 
Haplizo means to take up arms as if in grabbing a weapon, to be proactive, to seek out, to, to be ready to defend yourself, to be able to have a word for a hearer of anybody that might ask with the joy that's inside us. It says take up and, and, and have the same mind of Jesus. And the, just the thought of that blows, blows me away because I'm like, my goodness, I've seen what Jesus did as he walked here on the earth and how the Sadducees and the Pharisees continued to, to try to trip him up, to try to get him separated from his calling. And, and the, the remarkable the remarkable insight that he had and how he was to go about doing his ministry. I'm supposed to have that kind of mind. And I know that I don't have it in me. So I have to rely upon the spirit that lives inside of me to get a glimpse into what he has for me. And that's why we have to continue to be steadfast in the word. So we might know what that is. It says, Jesus suffered in the flesh and we ought to have the same mind. Now, we also wrestle in the flesh, don't we? We seek our own will for our own desires, for our own purposes, and how we can use that for our benefit. You know, as Christians, we try to put that aside, but we still have that sinful flesh, but we have to continue to suffer and die to ourselves. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17, that we're a new creation. It says, therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That we have to separate ourselves from our flesh and our own willful desires. That we have to put other people above ourselves. That we might esteem others greater than ourselves. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And man, that cross, what a, what, a, what a burden that is. Whenever you look at what that meant and the devastation and the torture of the cross and the times, and we have to die to ourselves, that selfish, self, selfish fleshly desire and put on the mind of Christ that we're willing to put up that cross on ourselves and we have to carry out his will. And through that, you're gonna have joys beyond measure, peace without understanding, even in times of suffering, that Christ is going to see you through because at the end, he is the victor and that we have victory through Christ. And it's him who strengthens us to go through this life. In Galatians, it tells us, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We're not our own. We have to put aside those. We belong to him. We are not of our own. He bought us with a price. We have eternal life. We have living water because of what he has done, because he has laid his life down for us. So once you surrender your life to Christ, you're no longer yours. You're, you're seeking to be well-pleasing to him. As it says, but, but no longer living for the flesh, but for the will of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not of your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Everything that we do, our desire should be to learn what the will of God is, to put aside our flesh, to put on the mind of Christ, and to go after his will. Haven't we fed the old man enough? Feeding that old dog. In verse 3, it goes on to say, For we have spent enough of our past life in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revileries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. I knew I was going to mess that word up. I'm 40 years old, and I've only been a Christian for 16 years. 
And I've spent more time knowing the world than I have knowing Christ. It breaks my heart that I wasted so much of my life feeding that old dog. Man, I could have, how much more could I have done in Jesus' name had I, had I known sooner? This world was never meant to bring you happiness, and it was never meant to fulfill your needs. It's only the love of God that can fill that void in your life. You have to continually seek his will for your life, putting off the old man, putting your mind on Jesus, being in the word that you might know what your calling is, so when it confronts you, you could call a duck a duck and say, yes, Jesus, this is, this is my calling. This is what you put in before me. Let me pick up my cross and, and, and follow you. And when you have the love of God, you have a peace that surpasses all understanding. But you know what? We, we can't, you know, even though it breaks my heart to think how long I was in the world and, and how short of a time I've been living for Jesus, I have to put that old news behind. That's old news. I, I've got to move forward. Us together as a body of Christ, we have to move forward. We have to forget of the old things in the past. All of that, all of that sin and separation from God. We have to put that aside. Otherwise, we're going to be carrying that baggage with us while we're trying to do the work. And, and, and the devil and the enemy is going to use all of those old things to mess with your mind. To say that you're not good enough. Remember when you used to do this. Remember when you used to do that. Yeah, that's, that's behind you. Have the mind of Christ. He bought you through his sacrifice on the cross when he died for you. All things became new. You're a new creation. That is no longer you. You were once red as scarlet, but now that you are white as wool. We have freedom and victory in Jesus. We did put all, haven't we had enough of that? Paul writes in Philippians 4.13, and if, if you have your Bible, please turn there with me. Philippians 4.13. This is so important. So important. The enemy is going to use your past as a stumbling block to your future and the calling in which God has for you. Philippians 4.13 says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, Forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in God in Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us as many as mature have this same mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. We have to have the same mind of Christ, forgetting on the things behind us, looking forward. Maybe God is going to use your past to reach those in your future, but you can't use that as a reason why you're not going to move forward in Christ and, and, and respond to the calling on your life. And one thing is that sure is you have a calling in your life for the work of the ministry, for the work of the kingdom here on earth, for eternity in heaven. You have that calling on your life. I don't, think, I don't care if you don't think you're good enough, you're smart enough, you don't understand the Bible well enough. It doesn't matter. God knows. God knows, and he's going to reveal that to you, and you have to be sensitive to that calling, to that upward call in Christ. And you have to constantly be in communion with God because he's screaming in your face, and because of the noise of this world, sometimes you don't even hear him. You don't see the forest through the trees. Have to have that same mind. We as a body, as, as it tells us, we have to have the same mind. We have to be like-minded, right? 
And, and, and we can't be like-minded of the things of this world. We have to be like-minded towards the things of Christ, the upward call, right? We have to have that mind of Jesus, as it says back in Peter. That we're obedient to the will of God. So now we have to ask ourselves, what's the mind of God? What does he want from us? He wants our hearts. He gave us his son. He wants our hearts. He desires that all men come to the saving knowledge of Christ, that no man perish. Now, whenever you have that mind of Christ, he wishes that no man perishes, then what does that tell you you have to do, that I have to do, is I have to have the mind to go out there and preach the gospel. And man, that's scary. And we're not equipped sometimes, and we feel that we're inadequate. Moses did. Moses said, why choose me? I don't speak well at all. And God told him, duh, I know that. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll give you the words to speak. He desires that Christians live a pure and holy life, that the church would be a hospital for hurting souls where the word can go forth and change lives. That we love our God with all our heart, with all our mind, and all our soul. That we would love our neighbor as ourselves. That we don't live a life that is content in our current situation. But we're constantly seeking to grow and move forward and helping other people to grow along with us. He desires that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We should have the same desire and compassion and mercy to help those who are in need. We no longer look at the benefits of this world and the things that this world has to offer, but we look for the eternal things, the things that are going to last after the passing of this world. Not the things that are perishing, not the passing pleasures of this world. That is, that's what God desires, and that's the things that we should desire. That's the heart that we have to put on, guys. And you know, all of the world is, is not for you to go conquer the whole world. This is for the church, the ecclesia, the, the body of Christ that we do. Your world in which you preach the gospel might be the block on which you live on. You can't do everything, but you can do something. And that's where we're going. That's where we gotta move forward. If you jump down to verse seven here back in First Peter, but the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. Guys, we're not promised tomorrow. We may plan for tomorrow, but we have to live for today. That we have to take every opportunity that we have to recognize what God's will is in our life and move forward preaching that gospel that no man will perish. I, you know, it, 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 it breaks my heart whenever I know how many people are going to hell and how many people I didn't talk to today about Jesus. And we have to take that seriously. And we have to be watchful in our prayers. Lord, give me, give me the words. Put me in the situations that I need to hear and that I need to see and that I need to step out in faith and move forward to your will. And you know, the crazy thing is you may not know what that is. You know, sometimes you don't even know how you got to the place you are until you look behind you at your history. But being sensitive every single day, being watchful, being in prayers is what he's called us to do. In verse 8 it tells us, and above all, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. It's all about love. It is all about love. Life, make no mistake about it, life is about relationships. First, it's our relationship with God. 
Then it's our relationship with our spouse, our relationship with our kids, our family, our church, our jobs, with people. It's not about things and stuff. It's about people. We've got a beautiful building here, but it's not about this building, is it? It may be the evidence of which God's showing his work, but it's about the people that are inside the building. And more importantly, it's the people who won't even come in the building because they're the ones who are perishing. The purpose of the church is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. For you guys to be equipped to hear God's word, to go out there and preach. It may be only a a preaching of your life and your actions. But it's all about love. We all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In verse 10, it tells us, as each one received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold of the grace of God. We all have spiritual gifts. God's given to us each a measure as he wills. Pastor Ray, for the last many weeks on Wednesday night has been talking about those spiritual gifts. And if anybody is lacking, pray to God whom he will give. But pray how you could actually use those for the kingdom. Because when you use your gifts, it will be love manifested in action. It's love in action. Love, you, you may have heard this, love's a verb. Love's a verb. It's action. It's by doing. Anybody can say, I love you. But it's the action that follows that gets you your buy-in. And whether or not they truly do. Be obedient to your calling. Step out in faith and let God be the light that shines in you. As you know God put a calling in your life, on my life. And I want to share with you guys what that looks like. And my prayer is that that through this, you would be encouraged. That it's not only a calling that God put in my life, but you guys participated in it as well. Because we as a church together, we're all locking arms in the spiritual battle. Not all of us can can go to Iraq. Not all of us can go to Meadow Lake. Right? But we together are in this, praying for one another, encouraging one another, speaking to each other in sims and uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. As the body comes together to encourage for the work of the ministry, we all can't be the eye. We all can't be a foot. We all play a role. And tonight I would just like to share with you what my recent role is that God put a calling upon Calvary Chapel, the Rio Grande Valley. In Isaiah 117, it says, Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, and plead for the widow. Martin Luther King Jr. said, tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by bad people, but it's the silence over that by the good people. The tragedy isn't whenever ISIS comes in and destroys people. The tragedy isn't the murders and the hates and the rape and the violence and the drugs that goes on. The tragedy is when those who have the word of God and those who can lend a helping hand refuse to do nothing. And God has entrusted us and gave us a heart to have compassion, to love those who are unlovable, to go into those areas that that are uncomfortable, that are outside of, of our doing, that we have to rely on him and his guidance to direct us in, in, in the way he wants us to go. Now, in order to tell you about this calling, I have to back up in, in time to really get, give you an understanding 
on how God manifested this calling in me going to Iraq over years. And without, without going over that, then you may not recognize what God's calling is on your life and how God sets things up and it's completely oblivious to you until you step out in faith. The children of Israel, they were walking into the promised land. And God says, step into the water and I will deliver you to the promised land. God did not part the waters until they in faith stepped out into the water. Then he separated and they could cross freely. So we have to, have to continue to step out in faith. And I want to put you, get, paint you a picture of God's sovereignty and his control over your life. About two years ago, I was in another profession introduced to a, a Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL, who was working as a CIA officer, a CIA officer. And we started working on some international terrorism issues, collection efforts, and we really hit it off because we were both Christians. And, and, and you know, we we're both Christians fighting evil. So we, we hit it off. Then about a year after that, he introduced me to uh, another retired CIA officer who has started a, a company assisting law enforcement in human trafficking. Of course, he and I hit it off because he was a Christian as well. So we started working for about a year in the area of human trafficking. And, um, you know, up until I retired in January, and um, I hadn't seen him since, hadn't heard anything from him, and didn't think much of it. You know, had a wonderful time, bless him, him and his ministry and what God's doing with him. Well, that was back in January, the last time I saw him. Well, about two months later, if you guys recall, um, Pastor Mike McIntosh was here. Pastor Ray was not. Uh, Pastor Mike came in, and Pastor Mike and I have talked over the years. He was a um, reserve officer for San Diego Police Department, also worked in the human trafficking field, so we kind of had that connection um, and, and so every time he came to town, we would talk about it. And he had mentioned that he had gone to Iraq on a human trafficking uh, mission a couple years ago. And I'm like, well, that's super cool, man. You know what, I've been doing, you know, some human trafficking stuff. And we started talking. Come to find out, the guy that I had been working, human trafficking, the, the former CIA Christian guy, was actually the guy that, was, that, that Mike knew him in this area of human trafficking. I'm like, that's pretty cool. What a small world. You know, you live in San Diego. I live in New Mexico. This guy, I don't even know where he lives because he's a ghost. Um, <laughs> right? So um, I'm like, that's, well, that's pretty neat. So I found out, okay, but Pastor Mike went, went over, overseas to deal with human trafficking. I'm like, I work there. Wouldn't that be cool if God ever used me in that area? You know, and he leaves and life goes on and, you know, that's, that's an old life and here I am serving God in his church, you know, uh, doing what I can to hold up Pastor Ray's enormous arms and the load he carries, right? So, but he and I, Pastor Mike and I really connected, but, but we moved on. About a month after that, Pastor Bob Grenet came out. He's on our board. He's the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel, Visalia. And, you know, there's just some of those people that you meet once in a lifetime, where you just connect with that person instantly. It's a rare commodity, but, but just something's there, and God knits your hearts together. It's happened to me one other time with Pastor Ray about 13 years ago. You know, and, and it's just God ordained, it's in a divine appointment. And Pastor Bob and I, as, as we kind of grew a couple months after Mike had left, we started talking, and we found out we had a whole lot of things in common. He was, a, he, was a, he was a Marine also. He was a, a Vietnam veteran, a combat veteran. I'm like, wow, that's cool. You know, what unit did you serve in? And he said, well, I was 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines. And I'm like, I was 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines. We're in the same regiment, like 100 years apart, right? <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. So I said, well, well, what did you do when you were a Marine? He said, I was an 0351. An anti and he says, what an 0351 is is an anti-tank assault. And I said, shut up. I said, I was an 0351. Are you kidding me? Right? So, so we just, you know, really got close, and we started praying for one another. And, you know, as time went on, 
um, Pastor Bob, I come to find out that there was this uh, ministry called All Things Possible, run by Victor Marks. You know, he's, he, Victor Marks has been out here to our church in the past. He was a victim of trauma as a child, went off to serve in the Marine Corps, had all kinds of violence and craziness going on up in his brain. And, but God delivered him from it, and he has now a heart for, for children. And he has this all things possible ministry and goes into jails within the United States and he brings the gospel to them. And he's got a, a video and a comic book that, that kids can relate to. Well, Pastor Bob was asked, apparently, you know, the year, uh, a year ago, last summer, Pastor Bob went out for the first time to Iraq to work with little children. And it's like, so, so Pastor Bob was asked again this summer to come out and, you know, maybe bring a guy. So Pastor Bob calls up, Pastor Ray and says, hey, you know what, I, I think Jason might be a good fit, with, you know, his background, his experience, you know, and, and you know, uh, uh, loves the Lord, you know, it's, it's, it's very, pe- they're very choosy in whom they take into that environment for, for a myriad of reasons you can only imagine. So Pastor Ray um, pulls me in the office and he said, hey, Jason, do you want to go to Iraq? And before he could get the words out, I'm like, yes, of course I do, you know, and uh, <laughs> Um, he said, well, don't you want to pray about it? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So, <laughs> so um, I'm a man of action. I, I like, I, you know, I'm going to go to Iraq. Why not? I don't even know what we're going to do, but let, let's go. So I'm like, he's like, man, you got to really pray about this. And Jennifer has to be on board. You got, I'm like, you know what? You're right. Absolutely foolish me, right? I'm um, just looking, you know, I, I'm just looking two feet in front of me. So Jennifer and I, we went and, and we prayed about it and we started putting uh, um, some things together. Um, Over the next six weeks, I discovered um, Pastor Bob and Pastor Mike were actually out there together the the year before, the summer together. And I'm like, that's crazy. I was talking to Pastor. I didn't know that you were with him. And he said, yeah, we were out there. Here's some videos. You know, me and Pastor Mike out there in Iraq, you know, loving on these kids. So I'm like, awesome. You know, didn't, didn't think anything of it. So I'm moving on. I'm starting to train. I'm preparing myself spiritually. Just finished Bible college. We were in, you know, John 13, Jesus washing the disciples' feet and, you know, training myself spiritually. Lord, what do you want me to do while I'm out there? I don't want to impose my experience or what I think uh, the ministry should be. I want to wash feet. That's it. I'm going to wash feet. I don't care what that is. Take out the trash, you know, uh, wash dishes, do laundry. I don't know. Whatever whatever you're... and, and you know, Pastor Bob had the same mind, and he said, you know what, and he said, Jason, you know, I agree with you, wash feet. He said, you know nothing, we shouldn't complain about anything. I said, you're right, absolutely, like-minded. Let's, we're going to go out there, wash feet, and not complain. And then he said, it's going to be 117 degrees. I said, are you sure we can't complain about anything? <laughs> I mean, like, nothing, no, nothing. Um, so, you know, so I'm like, okay, so spiritually, I'm getting fed. Jennifer's on board, she's all in, you know, because through this process, I called a special ops buddy of mine and run me through some firearms training drills up and over the hills and get my head kind of back in that environment. And one of the guys that was training with me, he says, hey, um, Jim has been out in Iraq recently. Uh, Jim, Marine Corps sniper buddy of mine. Um, you know, he was uh, my sniper team leader uh, at one point in time. He said, call Jim. He'll give you insight into the... Uh, um, Iraq and what you can expect and maybe what you could train for. So I called and he said, yeah, I've been out in Iraq. And he tells me that he was working for the CIA officer who was working with me in human trafficking, who was working with Pastor Bob, and both of them were working for Victor Marks out in Iraq. <laughs> they were doing intelligence uh, and security. And I'm like, okay, well, if this isn't God, I don't know what is that how do these people from all over walks of life come together for one common goal and nobody had their finger in anything? God just put it all together. Now, they didn't, they didn't go with me this time, but, I mean, it was just incredible. And it's funny that I would never have known the majesty and the miracle that God had in store had I not stepped out in faith knowing what God's calling was on for my life. And he's got that same calling for you. And you have to step on faith, and he's going to blow your mind with these miracles. And you're, it's nothing short of a miracle. It is not coincidence. It's God's providence. And it's, hand, and it's God's hand moving in the hearts of men to do his will. Because we have the mind of Jesus.
Now, while we were out there and we were praying, you know, we prayed, hey, what, what can we be praying for? And we had mentioned to you the church, and we had mentioned to, um, you know, Bob passed it off to his church. We passed it off to you. If anybody feels like, you know, you want to contribute financially, go ahead and, you know, just as the Lord leads, put in there. Well, uh, Victor had given us a number. He said, man, in order for us to continue in security, weapons, um, to get these kids child care, to um, do all, all, all the things that's going on, we're running out of cash. This is the number that we need. So we prayed about it. And, you know, we, uh, uh, the day before I left, um, we were six, $700 short, I don't know, um, from achieving that. But some, something moved in the heart of uh, one of the congre uh, congregants here, and we ended up leaving with the exact dollar amount in which we needed to continue the mission to get these kids back to safety. And, and I tell you what, nobody knew what that number was, but God knew, and he put it in the hearts of men to contribute. And, and a miracle, another miracle, went forth right before we left. Now, I'm having a little bit of computer problems here, so excuse me. There we go. So, we were on the, uh, we're on the plane. It, we were, uh, I think, 23 hours in the air. You know, we, we went from here to L.A., from L.A. to Qatar, Qatar to Erbil. It was about 23 hours in the air total. So, yeah, whenever, I, whenever I get to, uh, to Iraq and I'm, you know, I'm, putting the sleep out of my eye, and I open my window, and I'm thinking, all right, I'm, I'm on the other side of the world. I open up the window, and I'm like, we're still in New Mexico. <laughs> you guys um, throw it up there. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, we're in New Mexico. Wow. And, I, and, I, and I'm, we're flying, and I'm like, wow, that's, yeah, okay. This is kind of the South Valley, you know, the, the Rio Grande. And I'm like, you got, we're, we're already in Albuquerque. We flew in the entire place around the world, and we're back in Albuquerque. And then we landed, and then I saw, you know, oh, okay, we're actually at the Erbil International Airport, which is in Kurdistan in Iraq. But um, it was just funny. I got off, and that's what my buddy Jim told me. He said, he said I said, what does it look like? And he said, step out your front door. And I'm like, awesome, okay. You know, that is going to get to see something I haven't seen before. So we get there and, you know, we drive into the hotel and, you know, it was kind of, we go through customs and, you know, I've got um, my luggage. I'm like, I'm going to jail. I'm going to jail. I had more military equipment than any man should um, in my bags. You know, nothing, nothing illegal, but holsters and um, slings and pouches and vests and all these things, right? We're going to war a country, right? So, you know, not that we're fighting a war, we're there to serve, but we needed to be uh, uh, protecting ourselves. So we get there, uh, we, we get to a hotel, and um, get scared immediately. I've been in Iraq five times, I thought I was going to die. So this, this guy here, you, you could see, you know, I, he, we pull up, and he comes walking around, he, and he starts grabbing for my door. He's like, where did this guy come from? You know, and, and I, so I grab my knife. He's got an AK-47. I think he's going to kidnap me. I've been in Iraq for five minutes. Come to find out, that's what they do there in Iraq, is they carry AK-47s in front of hotels for security. So, uh, fear of my life right off the bat. Later on that evening, we went and um, I got to hang out with Victor, uh, got reintroduced to him, met with his wife, Eileen, and we saw um, baby... Um, my mind just, just blanked, excuse me. Um, so this, this young child, he was in Iraq. His name is... <laughs> um, baby boy. All right, I'll think of it here in a minute. It'll, it'll come to me. So anyway, he was out in, in, in Mosul. Um, the, the day that we landed, as Pastor Ray said, Mosul had been declared liberated. All right, so he'd been, been uh, liberated. So I'm like, okay, cool, things are going to be awesome. You know, Iraq army has it under control. You know, the, the baby boy here, he was um, there 
earlier that day, they were actually in Mosul picking him up because um, parents and uh, the baby were running down the alley. Um, ISIS machine gunners were shooting anybody who was on the streets to include um, civilians. And this boy's parents were shot and killed by the machine gunner uh, in the streets of Mosul. This little boy falls down miraculously. He was not hurt. A soldier comes running out to grab the boy to take him out of the line of fire. An ISIS sniper shot and killed that soldier that same day. They didn't know what his name was. They didn't know what his name was, so they, they named him after the soldier until they could find out where he was. If he, he had a respiratory problems. Uh, they, lice is real bad. They've been living in the dirt, the debris. And Victor was able to go across, grab this little boy, bring him back, get him some medical care. And I got to spend my first evening in Iraq with a little boy who has been an orphan less than 24 hours. The next day, I got to spend time with a, with a family. This family also lived in, in Mosul. This gentleman here in the middle, is um, he's, a, he's a general in the Peshmerga army. And this is his two daughters and his lovely wife. Because he's a general, he had heads up. They called him one night and they said, hey, um, ISIS is on its way, you need to get out. And he said, how much time do I have? They said, about 30 minutes. So they had to flee their home. That home was later taken over as a command post for ISIS. And these, uh, these people who live in Erbil, and Erbil is actually a relatively safe area um, within Iraq, relative being whatever. Um, so they, they left, and now they've, for three years, they've lived, they had this wonderful big home, uh, she was, her name is Sumar, she, she uh, was an accountant, she was very successful, um, but now she's cleaning and cooking um, for money. She had an engineering degree, an accountant, um, she had a company for many, many years, and her house was, uh, was burned down, and now they live in this, you know, one-bedroom uh, uh, condo, and they actually, they're Christians, you know, that's why it was, they were so fearful to leave because when ISIS gets a hold of Christians, they do uh, two things. They ask you to convert, and if you say no, they kill you. So they had to leave. And so they fled, and they come down here, and they had this wonderful meal and opportunity for us as Christians to come together and just fellowship, and we could encourage them and, and just, you know, rely on the, on the joy of the Lord because they didn't have it in them. And they, they, they said, well, you know, we have gone all out. We never eat like this, but we, as your special guests, we're going to treat you to this amazing meal. So, so we get around their table, and, you know, this, it, they, you know, they said, this is about a week's worth of salary for us to prepare this meal. And I started thinking to myself, I had this for lunch. But yet these people said, had so much joy leaning on the Lord that they were willing to spend an entire week's salary just to be hospitable to other Christians who were there. We were able to give this family um, some money to help this young little girl go to college um, who actually assisted Victor Marx in putting together the lion and lambs that we were handing out to children. And that's, that's one of our missions why we were out there is we went to an internally displaced people's camp where, you know, if you've heard of refugee camps, a refugee camp is where people are displaced from their homes from other countries and they go into a camp. These are internally displaced people's camps. It's like a refugee camp, but they're within their own country. You know, there's, we, walk, we, we drove in and here's some guys just hanging out next to the uh, community building. And here's us giving lion and lamb packages to young children these these kids it was it was surreal as to how zombie-like their countenance was you know until they got 
their gift, and then their, their gift was just so precious to them because they have nothing. They went from professional lives, living in a home, in an environment, to living in a one-room tent. They have been so institutionalized, baby Ali, baby Ali. <laughs> Baby Ollie, named after the soldier that gave his life for that little boy. But uh, th these guys, they had been so institutionalized living in this camp that they have to wait in line for everything. And here they are once again waiting in line for something. They don't know what it is. They got a comic book which you could see written in their own language, either in um, Kurdish or Arabic. And it's, it's the gospel printed out in, in a life story. They also received either a lion or a lamb, depending on if they were a boy or a girl. And that lion and lamb had music. You push the button and it, and it had music. And the music is so soothing to those who are living a life of trauma. And they had prayers in their own language. They were so excited to, to receive these things. They just lit up. We gave over 5,000 lion and lambs to these kids, thanks to the donations Thanks to the donations that you guys and Pastor Bob's church gave out. <clears throat> Sorry, I get choked up sometimes uh, seeing what God does in, in, a, in a time of tragedy. 5,000, these kids just, just adored us. Because everybody that goes there wants something. It's like living in a prison. The Iraqi government was so excited that we were there that all the media outlets, and you see all the uh, microphones up there, and you can see the little lion and lambs, Victor Mark's story, and all the microphones of the, of the regional medias doing a story as to how God is moving in the hearts of Americans who have compassion that it arguably started the whole thing. And now we're back to show them love. And it's Christ's love. Now, of course, we can't call it that. It's illegal. You can't proselytize in Iraq. It's a Muslim country. They'll arrest you. You do it too much. Not even, you don't even have to be an extremist. Some of the Muslims there will just kill you because you're preaching the gospel. This here is the IDP camp from a distance, and as you can see, it's just, you know, rows and rows upon rows. And if you notice, you know, you have towers with water and you have fences with barbed wire. It's like a prison, very much like a prison. When you get 50,000 people into a short, small area, there has to be order because crime will become rampant. So these people, not only have they been displaced from their home, but they are now put into a camp where they have no freedom to do what they want to do. It's run by the army. They have guards at the front. But they knew we were coming and they were waiting for us with smiles on their face because they knew that Victor Mark's ministry, the all things possible ministry was coming to love them and to give them a gift. And the Barzini Charity Foundation, the Barzini is the uh, Kurdistan president and he has a charity foundation. We teamed up with them to give many, many kids these lion and lamb gifts and a gospel comic book. Also in there, they had things of hygiene, toothbrush, band-aids, things that we take for granted. We got to play with them. Pastor Bob's over there doing the, uh, you know, my, my thumbs missing thing, right? And they ate it up. Oh, they had so much fun. They were just constantly, we were just doing all kinds of fun games with them, giving them hugs, loving on those children. We went to one IDP camp in Kirkuk. Kirkuk is probably one of the most dangerous cities that we went in outside of the actual war zone in Mosul. And, you know, we went in there, ISIS, we know that they were um, probably even within the camp. So, of course, 
You know, we had our weapons on us but for, for personal protection, but they were concealed, but we were there. Um, but even in, in one of the most dangerous areas where ISIS was probably actually in the camps or the families were in the camps, um, this little handicapped girl, she was scared to death. She did not want to come in the building. I was able to pull out this little lion and lamb. I mean, she was screaming hysterically. We pulled out this lamb, turned it on, the music instantly stopped. Biggest smile on her face, walked up, kissed me on the, on the cheek, said thank you, and she left just so excited with just a little bit of hope and a little bit of love and a little bit of compassion. Another little boy shook my hand, and when we gave it to him, he said, and he, and a lot of them speak English, a little broken, but he says, I love you. Thank you, guys. And, and he left. He was so grateful. Then, then I was reminded, you know, what, what, why we were there. They had a generator going to supply some power for the room that we were in. It backfired. Panic ensued. Kids scattered everywhere. Sheer terror. Because they have old souls that they ha- they've experienced war. And they thought they were being shot at. So we were able to bring them back in, sing with them, love with them, get them their, uh, um, their lion and lamb, and calm their, their spirits a little bit. These kids have been in these camps for two to three years. They don't know anything other than what it's like to live in a cage like an animal. But the love of Christ, love, surpasses and transcends all of that. And that's what we were out there doing. These are some Iraqis that are out there as part of the Barzini Charity Foundation. They were so excited that they were there, that they got to meet um, Americans, and that we were there loving on their people without an expectation of anything in return. This is just one example of just how excited these, uh, these kids were for us. You know, this kid, all he wanted was to take a selfie with me. So I took a, you know, he took a selfie and I took a selfie. So excited. So excited to be there. This young man, handicapped from the war, um, he was there, so excited. There's baby Ali, Victor Marx. This, this here is their restroom. And, and it's just a, an outhouse in the middle. There's 50,000 people in this camp. And this young woman here, she's actually washing her vegetables to prepare for dinner in the local water dispensary, right next to the, uh, the port johns Here's just a small uh, group of them. We went to, uh, I think, four or five um, camps while we were there. Just wonderful, beautiful people living behind a fence. You can see here the line goes on forever. It goes all the way around the, uh, the fence hundreds upon hundreds of kids just waiting for their turn to get their free gift and to get the gospel, which is also the free gift of salvation given to us by our Lord. Driving down the street, I I just thought this was cool. You know, a guy riding a donkey, taking a sheep, right across the highway. I was like, yeah, we're we're in Berlin. Here's just another... uh, um, Another uh, uh, picture of the camp. This is Mood Hafar. He and I exchanged emails. His life's dream, his life's dream was to meet an American. I was the first American he ever met. He and I connected. We exchanged emails. He actually loves America so much, he went and got a bachelor's degree in English. His life's dream is to come out here. He and I have been uh, corresponding, and you know what? My life's dream with him is that I get to minister to him and he gets to know the love of Jesus Christ. Here's Victor and his wife handing out lion and lambs and the comic books to these children. Super excited that we were there. And of course, I was representing each and every one of you guys. Here's my kit that I took out. Every day we had our um, helmets, our body armor, our plate carriers, our pistols, our AK-47s, 
helmets, all in case that we were attacked as we're going in. So this picture here is a picture of us leaving Kurdistan, going across the border into the war territory. You see, we've got a Kurdistan machine gunner. You see his flag right there, keeping anybody from going into Kurdistan. They have a huge pit drawn across the entire countryside, just like this, to make it more difficult for insurgents to come in. There was checkpoint after checkpoint after checkpoint, constantly looking uh, in our vehicles. We all had armored vehicles. Um, once they found out we were Americans, because the Americans are the ones who are still training the Iraqi forces, so they loved us. They, you know, we were always afraid that they were going to pull us out and look what was in our vehicles. You know, I know Vicar Marks had a couple hand grenades. There was guns, and we had uh, uh, rifles and body armor and. You know, um, we're in armored vehicles, but for the most part, they were pretty gracious. Every once in a while, we'd get pulled out, and they would look for our vehicles. We'd have to show our paperwork and our passports and why we were in the country, that we were part of a non-government officials, NGOs, um, there to do some relief. So as we're going through and we're, we're moving through, we just see um, the entrance to Mosul and just the destruction um, that's going on, all these uh, buildings that are riddled with bullets. Here's the Tigris River right before we got into, uh, into Mosul, which was a checkpoint. This is one of the checkpoints that they pulled us all out of the vehicles and looked around. And then whenever they found out who we were, it was super cool. This here, this is the gentleman that after Ali the soldier went and, 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 and grabbed baby Ali and took him to safety and died, this is the soldier who picked up Ali from that point and brought him back to safety after his soldier uh, friend had uh, just been killed. So it was exciting knowing that we got to actually meet the soldiers that were involved in that rescue. We were able to hang out with them, and you know we listened to music, dancing in the streets. Those guys were great. Just loved that we were there because we were there to help them. As we're rolling through, these are the only t Americans that I saw, and they were leaving. The, uh, uh, <laughs> it's like, well, that's not cool. Um, there, was, there was three uh, EOD vehicles um, that were leaving the area, going back across um, the Tigris ri River as we were going into Mosul. Now, I had told you, or Pastor Ray had mentioned, that the day we landed, that Mosul was liberated from ISIS, as the news would tell you. Somebody forgot to tell ISIS. Because the city of Mosul is, is the biblical name Nineveh. This is the Nineveh region. And we were on the Mount of Jonah taking this picture. And you, there, there was an airstrike going on. That's where all that um, smoke was coming from. Here as we're getting into old, the old town or old city of Mosul, you could see that the uh, houses are there. You have a big um, hole in the wall from an RPG. We're going through and we see houses riddled with bullets. This used to be a paved road. You still have children walking around. These children are trying to make a living on the side of a road in the middle of a war and torn country trying to sell water to survive. This is typical of what a neighborhood looks like block after block after block. Nineveh is the home of about, excuse me, Nineveh was the home of about 2 million people. Just people hanging out on the side of the road. You can see the signs are even shot up. We made it, so it was 5 o'clock, it was starting to cool down. <clears throat> so I was there to wash feet. Victor, knowing my background and having spent time with him, he allowed me to run security on the, uh, the supply truck that was almost entirely funded by our church and Pastor Bob's. And inside this was bags of rice and diapers and um, tea, powdered milk that we were going to distribute to all the people that are still being held 
not being able to move in the neighborhoods because supplies are cut off from ISIS and they're eating cats to tell you the, uh, the degree in which they're living. But this entire truck is full all the way to the top and people, Christians, Muslim, doesn't matter, there's people that are eating cats and we can't take that for granted and we were able to show them the love of Christ and they know where this came from. They know it was from Christians and who knows what God's going to do with that in their lives. It's not my business. It's between them and God but I know I did my part and you guys did your part to help deliver this there. These soldiers were there. We got to spend time, hang out with them. We got to, um, we, we showed up and the soldiers just came pouring out, excited that we were there. Victor and, and his guys clearly have made a mark on these men. This here is baby Teba. Guys, we're going to go a little late, so if you guys have to walk out and grab your kids, please do. I'm, I've got about another 10 minutes max. This is baby Teba. We went into Mosul to retrieve her. Same thing. She was out in the streets with her parents. ISIS snipers killed him. She was found in the rubble near her family. So we went and grabbed her, took her back to across Iraqi lines. You may have bent the rules a little bit. You just can't take children across country lines without paperwork, without parents. Um, uh, but we were there to, uh, to assist this young baby get back to their parents. So this is baby T, but we got her back. We took her to the hospital, and we were able to, uh, you know, this is uh, um, a special forces operator that was out there that we got to hang out with. The next day, we got called again, and towards the end, we were doing about 20-hour uh, missions going back and forth the war zone, grabbing up kids um, for the last week that we were there. This here is Sahara. We thought baby Teba was alone. Her parents were killed. She was found in rubble. The next day, they found her older sister. So we went back and we grabbed her. This is General Mustafa, the general of the 9th Army Division, who had partnered up with Victor Marks and Dave Eubanks of Free Burma Rangers, who were giving us these children. If you guys remember Dave Eubanks, he was on Fox News. He was behind the tank. A couple guys laid out uh, suppressive fire. S sniper fire was going. He ran out, grabbed the little child that was living underneath his mother's hijab for three days as she was dead. He saw that child. He ran out, grabbed her, brought her back to the tank, brought her back to, her name was Damar. Damar, which means tear in English. Brings this child, gives this child back to Victor. Victor and us and you guys were able to get her medical attention and back to her grandmother um, in Baghdad. This here is baby Tiba. We were able to get her back as well. This is her in my armored vehicle right behind me. Um, so excited. She's like, she wanted a selfie big time. Sweet girl. That same night, while we're getting Sahara... General Mustafa says, hey, we have a nine-year-old boy, Imad, at the casualty collection point around the corner. He needs medical attention, like right now, right now. So we go over and, and, and we grab, uh, we go into the uh, casualty collection point, and we find Imad, who had been um, blown up by a mortar shell. He had shrapnel go through his back. And out of stomach. Imad was an ISIS prisoner for three years. ISIS took over Sinjar Mountain, full of Christians and Yazidis. Killed the men and the older boys that didn't convert to Islam. We're presuming his dad and Brother are killed. They took Imad and turned him into an ISIS fighter for three years. He was an ISIS apprentice. His mom and sisters were taken as sex slaves. They were held captive for three years also. 
General Mustafa, when he came to their neighborhood, he got on the PA and said, you've got 60 minutes to give up or we're going to kill every one of you. And the ISIS fighters surrendered in that neighborhood. Mom and daughter was uh, liberated and they were taken to Canada. It's, it's been all over the news. If, if you haven't seen it, you could look it up. Um, took her to, took, took, the, presuming Imad was dead, hadn't seen her in three years. They, they, they went up to Canada to receive medical treatment and trauma care and you know the sexual abuse and everything else that went on being a prisoner of ISIS. Maud, actually, the reason why he has that patches is he was, he was patched up by an ISIS medic because they had turned him into one of him. So there's Imad in the back of my vehicle as we took him to the hospital because he was completely emaciated. This is how they found him. Imad last week was reunited with his mom and his sisters because of the love of Jesus. I just pray, guys, that you guys keep him in prayer. He's got a lot of undoing in his mind and his heart that needs to, needs to be taken out. All that hatred that ISIS had poisoned put into his, uh, into his mind and into his heart. But like Victor Marx's ministry, all things are possible with God. One of the last pictures I'll go through is this here on the, my left in the purple shirt. That's Pastor Adil. He's a, he's a Christian pastor in Kirkuk, excuse me, Dehuk, Iraq. His church has been, he's a Christian pastor. 20 years. He used to work for the Billy Graham Evangelism. Uh, he's born and raised as an Iraqi, and he's out there running a church. And Adil's church, Christian church, has been blown up, shot up. His congregants, he had one uh, congregant of his who was a cab driver who they filled full of AK-47 bullets because he was preaching the gospel. A deal is continuing steadfast after 20 years in this area as a Christian pastor. Pastor Adil needs our prayers. So we got to share with us and what, what God's doing. And Victor's ministry is raising $30,000 to hire him as an employee to be a full-time pastor within Iraq. And they're $11,000 short. And... Um, but we know that God's going to provide for a deal. He needs $30,000 to quit his job and do full-time ministry in Dehuk, Iraq for two years. And God's going to make that happen. I have faith. Lastly, I'm going to shortly uh, tell you, this is Delo, who's uh, right next to me, and that's Muhammad. That's Muhammad, who was an Iraqi soldier who was shot eight times trying to save somebody. And this is the dinner feast that we had with the parents of the man Muhammad saved. But unfortunately, Shaheem, which happens to be Victor Mark's um, interpreter, um, he didn't survive. But his family still honored us, and we still ate supper there. Um, and I'll tell you this story. Sunday, September 10th, Pastor Ray asked if I could share that story with the body on Sunday. But in all that tragedy, we had a wonderful time. We took these guys out, and I bought them dinner, took them to the movies, to give a little levity from uh, the work of the ministry that these guys are doing that's very real. And this is Delo <laughs> after we watched Spider-Man. <laughs> Still having the joy of the Lord, 
still moving forward, loving Jesus, doing what God's called them to do. And I just, my prayer is that, you know, we would continue to have the heart and that we would have their heart here within our valley. And we got, we, we've got so much tragedy and trauma here within our own community. It's amazing to see what God's doing over there, and we could be part of that. But we also have a responsibility here. We had an amazing outreach over there at uh, Daniel Fernandez Park. Sixty people came to Christ, and as you know, Pastor Ray said somebody who was in Wicca gave their life. Somebody who was... Um, contemplating suicide that night gave, gave the life to Jesus. 64 people. Because we weren't comfortable in these walls. It's been my experience that every time Jesus puts a vision upon Pastor Ray's heart, his people catch that heart and miracles happen. And we've got another one coming up in Anna Becker Park. We need to do our part. We need to know what our calling is and Step out in faith because people need you. People here in Berlin. I've been up to Meadow Lake. That's Meadow Lake. Right? People are hurting. But you know, we've got the answer and we've got the solution and we have the joy of Jesus Christ. We've got the answer. We're going to move forward, and God's going to do a miracle, just like they did in all of these young people's lives, just like these, the, the lives of these men that are out there who are showing the love of Jesus.